I think I'm a very bad timekeeper because the time has been slipping away from us. So I will reserve just one question uh, for the for the speakers to get the discussion going. And may we have your permission? No, since you are the head of FPA, that we started late. So may we at least have five minutes, so we can have a question or two. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you very. Thank you very much. Uh, State has really put us in the hot seat. So I would like to ask this question since Ukraine is on everyone's mind. And although uh, Paul Clifford does not think Taiwan is as big an issue as some of us, uh, I would add that Taiwan may become, as state forewarns, a really big issue. So no one has mentioned that uh, last Tuesday, China and Russia held their first joint military exercise since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in an apparent show of force as President Biden was visiting the region. What message does Beijing seem to be sending with this exercise? And more broadly, by being one of the few countries to side with Russia during the internationally condemned invasion of Ukraine. And the red lines are there, as they, as they put it. What are the implications for, of a Sino-Russian partnership for future U.S. foreign policy? So whoever likes to start. Mike? Well, <clears throat> I, I think you're all aware that the, uh, there were uh, last week six bombers, I believe, four Russian and two Chinese, if I recall the, the count. And they flew into the South China Sea and between Japan and Korea. So I think the first message here is the strategy. I think China's uh, very disturbed by the U.S. strategy of mobilizing allies, increasing Japan to play a bigger role, trying to patch up relations between Korea and Japan so they can jointly play a bigger role. And uh, China's simply stating it doesn't like that policy. Secondly, I think there's a, uh, a, the red line on Taiwan. And that is, uh, to put it bluntly, I think China is sufficiently motivated on Taiwan. It will engage in conflict even if it loses in the short run. Uh, in other words, I think the regime believes it cannot survive a per what would look to the Chinese people to be a permanent change in the status towards separation and they would actually choose to engage in a conflict they had no confidence of winning. Uh, also, I would just say in that regard, uh, I think the, uh, the Chinese wonder, what is the level of commitment Americans really have underneath it all? We, we're, we, we tend to be a little more optimistic about interventions when they start than when they end or when they become more costly in human life and so forth. So I think the Chinese have no doubt we're serious about Taiwan and that President Biden was, in a sense, doing away with the ambiguity. But I would just say the Chinese are not ambiguous about the U.S. moving towards what state call, or at least the Chinese might think, is the one China, one Taiwan policy, which they said they would never Except that's one of the few things they've actually been consistent about over the years. And by the way, I might add here that over nine months, Biden has said three times that we will go to the defense of Taiwan. And so people are debating whether this is a gaffe that the last time. And more and more people are saying it's not a gaffe. It's that he is sending a strategic signal to Beijing and that our policies are changing. Yeah. And China is very clear about that. Yeah, um, first of all, I, I did talk about Taiwan because I, I was outside what I was meant to talk about. 
wanted to talk about. But I feel very strongly about Taiwan. I have many friends. I, I, I know Taiwan very well. I think that China's policy towards Taiwan hasn't really changed very much, actually. It's been consistent. Um, and we know you know we'll take it back by force if necessary. I don't think short term they want to. <coughs> That it would be catastrophic, and the idea of the China capture TSMC's factory is not the issue at all. It's all about the you know the historical uh, uh, responsibility to take it back, you know. And so, my concern is that that Biden, for instance, yeah, he, this is not a gap. This is him playing a smart, you know, very smart game. Um, but it's not. It's a very foolish game because the danger is that it will change the dynamic, dynamics of the DPP and the KMT and give, you know, if the DPP gets kicked out in Taiwan or, or, or changes, it might go in the direction of independence. Who knows? So the idea of making them into an ally that we can support them just fuels the idea that there might just be a road to independence. And that will be catastrophic diplomatically and politically and militarily. Um, just to go on Russia very quickly. Um, I, I, I think China has um, he, it's failed to do all the things we've been up. I've been calling them up, and emailing my friends, tell the Politburo to, to you know, get America off your back by doing all the right things. They, they won't do it. But there are things that they have done. For instance, in the very early days, they talked about American defensive weapons going to Russia. Defensive? That's a signal. And then if you look at, um, I think it was uh, Jake Sullivan, he had seven hours with Yang Jiech. Seven hours, what were they talking about? What well, my bet is they were talking about SIC codes. All the things that China wants to know they could still trade with without getting in, getting secondary sanctions. So China I think is extremely extremely cautious and wants to avoid um, and like union pay. The Russians wanted union pay to help empower their card, credit cards. China said no way for a variety of reasons. So I, I, I think China hasn't gotten where we'd like it to go, but I, um, you know, I, I feel it's um, it taking a, a very nuanced position on the fence, if you like, but without attracting countermeasures like um, secondary sanctions. That's it. Any further words on Ukraine and Taiwan? Uh, no president should speak off the cuff about taking an action that could bring nuclear missiles raining down on American cities. Uh, that's simply not the right way to talk about it. This concept of strategic ambiguity is a misnomer. The Taiwan Relations Act is very explicit. It says that any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than Pacific means, including by boycotts or embargoes, is a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific and a grave concern to the United States. The President is directed to promptly inform Congress of any threat to the security of Taiwan and, in accordance with constitutional processes, to take appropriate action by the United States in response to any such danger. You can't conclude from that that the United States would not become involved. People compare this to the modern Article 5 of NATO. What does the Article 5 of NATO says? It says that an attack on one is an attack on all, and they should take such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force. Well, I'm sorry, you can quibble about what, what these things mean. I think both of these agreements one in the China Relations Act, which is not a treaty with another country, and one in the NATO agreement, indicates clearly that the United States will be involved if Taiwan is subjected to threats. Uh, so, given the fact that we're talking about dealing with major nuclear powers, it seems to me that the goal should be to adopt policies designed to make conflict unlikely. And that's why I put such emphasis on red lines. We ignored Russian red lines on Ukraine, and the result is a war in Ukraine. And if we ignore Chinese red lines on Taiwan, we are going to be in conflict with China over Taiwan. We can defend Taiwan, we cannot protect it. Look what's happening in Ukraine. 
We're defending it, and it's being destroyed. That doesn't in any way diminish the bravery and courage and will of the Ukraine people to defend themselves. But the fact of the matter is a conflict over Taiwan is the worst thing that could happen to Taiwan. And the U.S. policy should be designed to prevent the conflict, not to prepare for it. On that note, are there any questions? I think we can take one. Well, it has to be Dane. Is that fair? Thank you all very much. I just wondered. Oh, um, thank you all very much. I I just wondered. Um, from from what you said, I certainly agree with uh, Ambassador Roy and all your worries. Do any of you have um, direct uh, input into the Biden? Well, I can volunteer that uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Who are the who are these advisors? Democrats. Well, um, I think I can give a little uh, background here. If you go back to uh, the uh, Obama administration and Secretary Clinton, and you may recall that in it was 2010, we initiated what was called the Pivot to Asia or Rebalance. And many of the people that were in that administration and were most associated with the development of Pivot, it was the idea to put relatively a greater percent of U.S. naval and other forces in the Pacific rather than the Atlantic. We should get less involved in Central Asia, Middle East conflict, and up our capacity in Asia. So it wasn't a complete reversal, but it was a sort of percentage shift in attention towards Asia. It also initially had an economic component, which we never really developed, and became mostly a military kind of statement. But the point is, but the people that were most energetically involved in the development of the rebalance, many of them are now in the administration here, see that China's behavior has, from their point of view, probably all our points of view, has not improved. And therefore, you see this more, I would say, much more muscular version of, of the pivot. It deserves more discussion. But these people have a policy history before China's behavior didn't improve uh, during the Trump period. And so they've come back uh, in not exclusively, but important component of the current policy process. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been flip, flip, flippant. Uh, Biden has a very formidable, experienced, professional foreign policy team around him. They worked for, many of them worked for uh, Obama. Many of them worked under uh, uh, Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. So he has experienced people around him. I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to follow up with Mike. In terms of the quad, how do you place it in terms of grand strategy in this context? Well, I think we're trying to develop as many frameworks of a military relationship, the framework agreement on the econo economic side, well, I think we're trying to do uh, everything we can. We're trying to get Japan and Korea better aligned with each other. We're trying to get India involved, in, in this case, in the Quad as well. Each of these countries has their own interests and fears in becoming too identified uh, in a sort of anti-China condominium from PRC point of view. So it's complicated, but they're trying to build as many multilateral economic and military arrangements as they can as an offset to what they see as China's quite successful is building economic relationships that what's called RCEP, the 16 nation trade arrangement uh, and it's also making bilateral agreements throughout the region with countries so you have a kind of competitive building military and economic organizations to compete with one another. I can't let them stand there, uh, Mike, and, and, and you too, Paul, I want to ask, do you think IPEF really has a chance to be competitive with what China and all of its 
uh, uh, new institutions are, are doing in, in Southeast Asia? What, what sorry, what, what competitive? Uh, I, IP, the, the, the Indo-Pacific yeah. economic framework. Do you think it, 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 it can compete? Um, I, with China, you mean? Yeah. You, you think it can? I think it can. I mean, there's even some talk of uh, people. I, I think it can. I think the um, the whole the notion it depends how rigid or uh, practical it becomes. Uh, I think the, a lot of these the talk on the Chinese side and on the U.S. side is about uh, alliances and people talk about these South Pacific alliance and that's not the way. You know, I I know I met the you know the Prime Minister of Fiji and you know he's very pro Chinese actually. Um, but so we, we should discount some of these grand things that China cooks up. And, I don't know, I mean, can the IPEF, can, can Biden's uh, new framework, yeah. a, you use it, it can. I, I think it's, it, lacks, it lacks that other dimension of cooperation. I think that it's all, much of it designed to, to, to be militarily or commercially in, encircling as opposed to allowing for China to flourish. But do you, do you think it makes up for our leaving the TPP? And now there's a, there's a successor to it's yeah. CPTPP. Well, um, there was something. That's a Trans-Pacific partnership. Uh, partnership. Yeah, I, I thought that was a great construct. It had so many social benefits. I mean, that was a mistake that we left. But um, I, I, I think that it can, it can succeed. Um, uh, it depends on what, what you know. What, what measures are pushed through it in, the, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the 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 conditions of trade and things like that. A positive note. Shall we end here? No. Yeah, I think we should hear one. Oh, what? Well, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see yeah. that. I didn't see that. Sorry about that. Stay. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say finally a positive positive comment. I thought maybe we should end since it's time for drinks and food. <laughs> Sorry, stay. No it's good to see you, even though virtually. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>